these like uh, any virus companies decide to block yeah. live streaming? Right. Okay. So we are. Okay. Perfect. Cool. I will keep this super short, but I just wanted to tell you guys about a uh, fun adventure that I had trying to get JavaScript to do 64-bit uh, integer math. This talk is also known as Watt.js Integer Edition. Uh, if you guys remember the original. Okay, so in uh, in real programming languages, uh, they have different integer types, like uh, signed and unsigned 32-bit ints, signed and unsigned 64-bit ints, and then the CPU itself can can handle all of those uh, as well. In JavaScript, you have this type called number, uh, and <laughs> uh, that makes it hard to deal with these, and especially hard to deal with those. Cool. So. Uh, Integers in JavaScript because the numbers are actually 64-bit floating points, uh, like 64-bit floats. Uh, you can represent integers from from uh, that odds. Then uh, after that, it'll just like stop incrementing. So actually, I'm not going to demo that. You guys know about that. Um, so if you want to restore some sanity to it. Uh, Modern JavaScript has things like U and 8 array and U and 32 array that let you deal with uh, basically those are subsets of, of what can be represented using a 64-bit float. And it, it lets you store those more efficiently and do math with those a little bit more efficiently. And so far, it works the way you'd expect. But there's a lot of unfortunate stuff that happens. For example, plus 1 and OR1 should both be no ops, but OR1 uh, like auto converts it to a signed 32-bit integer. JavaScript likes to do that. So if you say plus one, you end up with four billion. But if you say or one, you end up with negative one, uh, just for fun. Is that why you can uh, floor a number that you want to to? So well, that's so that isn't or. Uh, oh, sorry, that doesn't that isn't floor. That that uh, took it and did something pretty terrible with it. Uh, if you have a number that fits into a signed 32-bit integer and you do or zero, then it'll floor it. Uh, but if you uh, have a number that uh, doesn't fit into a signed 32-bit integer, it will it will coerce it into a signed 32-bit integer. And so, for example, u and 32, that's unsigned 32-bit integers. And so or zero will actually do this uh, odd transformation on it. So just treating the leading one as the signed uh, that, what's it, What it's doing is equivalent to, to like interpreting the bits of a of a unsigned two's complement thirty two bit integer and treating it as a signed thirty two bit integer. And so that's why you get weird stuff happening. Um, that is a uh, photo of Brendan Eich. Uh okay. Uh, the kind of cool news, uh, the U and X array uh, types, not only are they efficient and fast, but they also impose some sanity. So for example, if you uh, stick anything into a UN32 array, uh, even if, if JavaScript has munged it, like what I showed on the last slide, uh, then the UN32 array will magically turn it into a correct unsigned 32-bit integer again, and basically make it behave reasonably again. Uh, I didn't show this here, but if, you, if I said A of 0 equals hello, then it would be equal to 0 afterwards. So it'll take all of the different JavaScript types and convert them to UN32s. Uh, so why am I dealing with all of the sadness? Um, and we've only talked about 32-bit uh, integer math so far, where we're going to do 64-bit integer math, which is uh, a lot nastier, because you have to simulate it using 32-bit integer math, because JavaScript just straight up doesn't support 64-bit integers. Uh, so there's this hash function, and I wanted to be able to use it in a browser. You can't currently. It's uh, If you guys know about hash functions like MD5 and SHA-1, uh, this is a modern alternative to those that has some nice advantages. Uh, Right now, the only node module for it uh, that it existed, well, until recently, the only node module for it that existed uses node jip. And so you can only run it in node. You can't run it in a browser. And so I wanted to make a JavaScript implementation. But this does 64-bit integer math. So the first thing I tried was representing a 64-bit integer as a JavaScript array of two 32-bit uh, integers. That leads to a lot of sadness because of that signed conversion uh, that I was talking about earlier. It actually is two signed 32-bit ints. And then if you want to do, say, 64-bit integer addition, you have to do all of these, these nasty checks, if that makes sense, to get it to come out right. Uh, 
I uh, implemented the to be off of the RFC. Where is it? Yes. This is the actual algorithm we're talking about. Uh, I basically took the you know description of it from the RFC, wrote it in JavaScript in the most like direct translation that I could, and it was abysmally slow. Um, if you ever have, have a chance to skim this, by the way, this is kind of interesting. It's really kind of interesting and cool how hash functions actually work under the hood, given the magic that they're capable of. You guys were talking about things like IPFS and things like Merkle trees earlier, and you know, uh, like how is it that you can be absolutely certain that there's, uh, or near absolutely certain that there, there's no two separate strings that hash to the same thing? Uh, uh, with a good hash function, uh, under the hood, they do a lot of magic involving a lot of magic numbers designed over a period of years by by some people who are very good at math. Uh, fortunately, they've all done that. We just have to implement it. Um, it was slow, so let's make it fast. Let's put it back on present. Uh, so using uh, UN32 array and doing all of the math directly in there without actually making a JavaScript object for each 64-bit uh, int is a lot nicer. And it also avoids having to do all of those uh, negative checks because the UN32 array courses everything to, to, to being like non-negative for you. Um, and it also packs more nicely and it doesn't use memory so prodigiously. This is a lot faster. This is like 30 times as fast. Um, in short, if you have to do any kind of robust integer math in JavaScript, consider using the uint something types. Uh, it, I think they have uint 8, uint 32, and uh, uint 16. And those are fast and awesome. Uh, here's a bit of a rundown of, of the performance, just to summarize <laughs> and tie things together a little bit. Uh, so doing 64-bit uh, integer math. <laughs> Uh, with uh, just uh, treating each 64-bit unsigned integer as a JavaScript array that has two, basically the low bits as, as one number and then the high bits as another number is really abysmally slow. Uh, packing it into a UN32 array is 30 times as fast. Uh, using no JIP and calling out to optimized x64 assembly is another <laughs> 30 times as fast. Uh, and so, in between, there's those question marks. I haven't tested yet what it would be like to use mscript in an asm.js, but presumably it's somewhere in between 15 and 540. Uh, definitely use this if you're writing server code. If you're doing Blake uh, to be in a web app, you'll have to make do with this, and there's a node module for it. Uh, fortunately, that's actually fast enough for like most of the stuff you'd want. Sweet, any questions? overhead ah, with um, doing these kind of hashing and um, basically algorithms that an analyze every byte. I assume Blake analyzes every byte in a buffer. Uh -huh. uh, slows down in JavaScript a lot because uh, because JavaScript doesn't have value types. So it requires like a pointer to your reference every time, um, which is why it was a lot faster to do it native. Do you know anything about that in relation to this? Um, I don't quite know what you mean. Uh, what I do know, so basically, when when in this original implementation, uh, every 64-bit integer is its own heap allocation. It's its own JavaScript right. array, and so it's not a value type, and that's really slow and really unfortunate. Uh, I'm most curious that about you probably it's not directly related to 64-bit integers. Yes. You probably have some code that loops through a buffer or something like that. Yes. So the nice thing is, so if you don't copy anything out of there, um, uh, so what this one does, for example, uh, it takes a reference to a, a UN32 array and then then two indices into it, and it does all of the math uh, basically in here, storing the result back in here. Uh, and so I think that when you know V8 goes and JIT compiles this and optimizes it, it actually turns it into something like reasonably nice. Um, but the unfortunate thing is it will only output, you know, 32-bit integer instructions. And so it's still a lot 
slower than using the actual like hand optimized 64 bit instructions. Uh, you see, um, after this, I think we, yep. should, we should try testing some. Oh, I just wanted to say there's a there's a library called bn.js which is written by Fedor it, it Dutney who's like uh, works on Node Core and it's like a pure JavaScript big num library. And I wonder what the performance of that is compared to the stuff that you were hacking. Uh, that's different. So, so that's going to be that's going to be really slow, but it's also solving a harder problem. Uh, so, like big nums are numbers that can be a lot bigger than sixty-four bits. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for example, if you wanted to, to uh, say implement RSA in JavaScript as opposed to this this little hash function, and you need like you know numbers that are thousands of bits long. And then you need to add them and multiply them and stuff like that. Then I think that's where you'd use that. Mm. Uh, this was a slow version, by the way. This was it uh, taking 22 seconds to to hash four megabytes, which is very sad. And this is it being a lot faster. Is, uh, is the in parts of this U the UN64 parts of this is that in a separate module? Can we use that some in our own things? No big, I mean, I could try to pull it out, but it's it's pretty inline to make it fast. So if I say, this is the part that actually does 64-bit integer addition up there. I don't know if this is big enough for people to actually read. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's actually, it's actually implemented twice because one of them is, you know, add two different, in like, uh, indices in a uint32 array, and it's actually so. Say say you're doing this with like index zero and index two. It's actually <laughs> adding the the 64-bit int at index zero and one to the 64-bit int at two and three, and then storing the result in zero and one. Do you see what I'm saying? And, and then uh, uh, this one down here, uh, you know, adds a constant to an array index instead of two array indices to each other. Uh, and so basically, it's not something that is uh, particularly clean to like separate out, if that makes sense. This is the actual mixing part of the. I, I, I tried to explain what's going on because otherwise it just can't be read. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. And so, so the 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 uh, profile for the 200 kilobyte per second version looks really sad, and the profile for the for this version actually looks nice. Uh, basically, the the top couple of stack frames are are always green. They're like, you know. Uh, optimized. optimized JIT compiled, and it, it's still you know like a factor of 20 slower than the no JIT version. If that makes sense because optimized x64 assembly written by DJB is going to be hard to beat in JavaScript. Do you know if the optimized version in Node is relying on vector like like SSC instructions? Oh, to get that performance? Not. You don't think so? In fact, not only does it not have to, like... Oh, right. I guess it's just doing... No, I mean, like, is it doing, s like, single instruction, multiple data, like, hashing many not bytes at once? Not uh, it's not doing a much more basic thing that doesn't even involve that that would make it faster. Uh, I don't think that, that uh, V8 outputs 64-bit integer instructions because JavaScript doesn't do 64-bit integers. And so if, it's, if, if, you're, if you're emulating 64-bit integer math using 32-bit integer instructions, it's going to be like a factor of however many slower just off of that, even if it were perfect. Sure. Yeah, so that's what's going on. But it's still, it works in a web app, and it's, it's, it's pretty decently fast. I think it's decently optimized as far as JavaScript 64-bit int math goes. <laughs> oh, the native implementation. Oh, yeah, uh, I have no idea. Okay. All bets are off with that. By the way, supposedly uh, those those like really fast uh, instructions, like SIMD instructions, are coming to JavaScript soon. So that'll be cool. Cool. Okay. After a few technical issues, um, I'm just going to show you quickly how to do what while you're sleeping and we're talking uh, about before about if we could be on a local network and if we could just like see all the, the websites that each of us had without having a central uh, DNS server um, and, a, and, and a central a lo a localized uh, Google that we can search for DNS uh, for, for websites. Um, so there is a thing in 
at least Safari, I, to be honest, I haven't tested this in other browsers, but if you go into preferences, this used to be enabled by default, but um, at some version they, they stopped having it on by default, but it's still here. So if, oops, um, go again. Uh, so if you go into if you go into your your settings in the preferences in Safari, and uh, click on advanced, there is a setting called Bungshure. Um and if you enable include Bungshure in the bookmarks menu, it will um, show up in your bookmarks menu, or you can do it in the favorites bar, all the websites that are on your local LAN. So if we go over here, and I've, I've made a, um, so I made a small um, script that just starts up a bunch of HTTP servers, um, and is using uh, Bungshure to publish uh, them as type HTTP, um, and then give them some names on different ports, just to show this working. Um, and if you run that, then now all of you guys, if you enable this setting, should be able to go into your bookmarks thingy, and there should be a menu option called Bungshure. Um, and if you if 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 you um, click on one of those websites, uh, so if you click on on my first website, um, it will not work for some weird reason because be, oh, okay, <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, Uh, I, I'm using Safari. Um, I can't find it on phone. Uh, oh yeah, sorry, rest.end. Thank you. Oops. It's hard to use Wim with one hand. Um, so that's what you get by making this in the last minute. So let's start it again. Thank you very much. Um, then let's open up a new tab. Go to the bookmarks. Bungshure, my first website, and. It shows hello world, and if you want to visit the other one, we can go to Bangshur Polar Bears, and I'll say, hey, I'm a polar bear. So if you're using Safari, I, this is the only uh, browser I, uh, that I know how to do it. It might be possible to do in other browsers as well. I'm not sure. But if you're using Safari, you go into Preferences, uh, click on the Advanced tab, and you can enable the Bangshur menu. So of course it requires that your network that you're on uh, allows multicast DNS for everybody to see it. I don't know if this one does. It does. Yeah. It does. Okay. It does. I see it, but I can't like load. I can't load it. Uh, we probably have a firewall on. Yeah, you can firewall. I may be, I may have my firewall on. Um, so that's it. That's um. Oh, and and one 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 thing is that you can also um, like this is interesting to actually do. If you go on a corporate network, you will actually see that this is being used, but nobody is actually using it. So when I was at the office the other day and went um, went in here uh, in the menu, um, it actually started showing folders. So there's a way by using something called subtypes in the ZeroConf standard that you can group uh, things that it will then show in folders. So you, will, uh, you can make like a subtype called printers. So all the printer admin interfaces will be in a folder called printers. You go into that and you will have, all your printers will have admin interfaces that you didn't know about that you can access just by clicking here and it will get you into the printers. Yeah? That's so cool. Wait, I bet there's yeah, a way awesome. to do this in Chrome. Do you uh, have to use it? Yeah, there's probably a way to do it in Chrome. I, I just uh, looked it up. Uh, for Chrome, there's an extension of, of some sort that you have to install. Great, there's an extension for Chrome. That's cool. Should, should we uh, try your computer again? Let's see. Yeah. It, it used to be enabled by default um, by Apple, but I guess nobody's using it. So, but it's still there. Yeah. It's a nice feature for for our use case. I mean, you could totally just uh, make a Chrome extension that would replace your new tab page with. Yeah. With Yeah, without HMI, maybe that's uh, maybe it's. But we got it working once. Yeah. 
as long as it's um, not blinking. <laughs> oh, stop blinking. Cool. And now something is happening. Is g g give it a second. It's blinking more. I had to, to change the resolution to uh, 720p just to be, oh, there it is. It's working. Cool. All right. Um, I'm John. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, I'm Jay Heisey on GitHub, J-H-I-E-S-E-Y. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about video. So as probably most people here know, the easy way to use HTML5 video is you have a video element and you can either set a source as an attribute or you can add these source tags inside. And when you do that, now these, this is like, like a test page run by the W3C. Um, for some reason, the videos don't actually load, but that's okay. Um, the important thing about that I just wanted to mention here is when you you know, start playing the video and when you seek around in a video, the browser does all of the hard work of figuring out what byte ranges need to be fetched and essentially how to get the video to play. And that's really nice. So as long as you're fetching the video over HTTP or HTTPS or something like that, the browser does all the hard work for you and things are good. The question though is what do you do if you want to take, have, um, play a video that's on something else, like WebTorrent, for example. So I don't know if all, all of you have been to the WebTorrent.io uh, demo page, but I can open it just very quickly, but I don't want to take down the network. <laughs> um, so there's this video that plays. Um, or should play, and the idea is that it does properly stream and you can seek around in the video, and the question is how does that work? So uh, maybe I, as soon as we see the first few frames, yeah, that's the video, and you can seek and it works. So the question is how does that work? So I wrote this uh, module called Video Stream that actually does this, and Unfortunately, it's a lot more complicated <laughs> than the simple regular HTML5 video. So there's two ways to get video data into the video tag. You can set the source, which is the simple case, or you have to use the API called the media source extensions. Now this is a very different API, um, and it's a little bit, it's a little bit complicated, unfortunately. It's, it's the only way to get video data into like a video element or audio into an audio element other than setting the source to something over HTTP. So if I just want to play something on WebTorrent, this is kind of what I'm stuck with. So I don't want to explain how this all works, but basically <laughs> the idea is you have the video tag is attached to this thing called the media source object that you can attach these source buffer objects to. And essentially, there's different ways. You can use it in a number of different ways. But essentially, you're feeding data by appending uint eight array, you know, array buffers, basically, into, you have to append the array buffers into the source buffer. And that causes the browser to buffer. So you know, like if you're playing a YouTube video and it, the video shows you how much is buffered, that's in the browser's buffer that's, that, that, that is, represented by this source buffer here. So does YouTube use this? Yeah, YouTube uses this. Um, so this is actually how YouTube videos work um, because they do all the adaptive bitrate switching and seeking and stuff. If they didn't want to do any of that, fan you know, change the quality, they wouldn't have to do any of this. That would be a lot simpler. But they want seamless quality changes. Um, so they use this interface as well. Now, the annoying part, though, is this doesn't give you you don't get much feedback from the browser. Like you don't know, the browser doesn't tell me you, oh, I need these bytes from a video file. It just says, I'm waiting for, the browser will tell you that it doesn't have the data it needs. And that's all it will tell you. It'll tell you it needs data and it'll tell you the time 
that the video is at. Like, I'm waiting at time, you know, 10 minutes into the video, and I don't have data. And you, as the user of this API, have to actually figure out what data that is and then package it up in a way that the browser can actually understand it. In other words, you have to, you have to take the raw video data and append metadata in front of it that says this is video for this time range so it knows where to put it in the buffer and you know these are all the parameters for the video. Unfortunately, that isn't the format that videos come in, so you essentially have to repackage them. So originally, the video stream module used this project called mp4box.js, um, which is, you can read about it. Essentially, it's something that specifically is designed to do this packaging, but it sucks pretty badly um, for, actually using with something like WebTorrent because it keeps an entire copy of all the data it's ever seen in memory. It doesn't, you don't have to download the whole video before you can start playing it. At least it doesn't do that, but it doesn't ever really evict anything and it's also quite slow in general. So this is what I built video stream on top of initially and this is how you actually use video stream. You have to give it a, yeah, yeah. You, you give it a file object that has a length and a create read stream function. And then you can attach the, um, attach the uh, file to the video so that it streams into the video tag. And this file, theoretically, of course, you could back this with HTTP range requests, but that's kind of silly given that the browser will do it for you. Um, but instead, this could be, uh, the file object that WebTorrent exposes, which actually has this API. So it's nice and easy to use. The problem is it didn't work very well. So I finally, inspired by Matthias, who wrote a nice module called uh, MP4 stream, this, uh, I thought, well, let me actually try to rewrite this from scratch using MP4 stream. So what I've done is, just to give a little bit of an idea of what's going on, um, so I have the, the uh, video stream module that uses, that's as actually essentially parsing the incoming video file and seeking to the right parts of the video file. And it, it understands the MP4 container specifically. So I don't know how much people know about video, but in, with media in general, and especially video, there's a container format, and then there's streams within the container that have a that use a particular codec. So, for example, um, the most common these days is there's something like an MP4 container that contains like one video track and one audio track, or something like that. So, this understands the container format and understands all the metadata in the container format. So things that are in the container include, you know, what byte ranges are what? What type of frame is this? So there's different types of frames in video that like a frame can depend on previous frames or it cannot depend on previous frames and things like that. And all of this data is encoded in a uh, nice complicated binary format. <laughs> so this is an actual look inside of a video file. Um, now, this is actually not maybe as bad as it looks. This is a tree structure. Um, so basically every element has four bytes of size and then four bytes of type and then some stuff inside of it and the format is defined by this very complicated spec. It's at least fairly clear. Um, so essentially what I'm doing is using MP4 stream, which I've modified substantially, to parse that and it generates, basically this computes the tree for me from the headers of the video file. And then I have to take that, which, which is in the format of essentially an, a normal MP4 file 
has all of the metadata up front and then all the frame data at the end. So the beginning is all the metadata and the rest of the file is the, actually, the header is up front and the video data later and it has to interleave all of this together so that every time you feed a chunk of data into the source buffer in the media source API, it, um, it uh, every time you feed this uh, data in, it knows what that particular video data is, you know, what the time ranges are, where the frames are in that particular video. So I have a quick demo here. Can I ask a question? Yeah. If the browser is, is, is uh, telling you that it's waiting for video data at 10 minutes into the video because the user just seeks there, mm -hmm. and it's saying like, it's like many events saying like, I need this video, why can't it just understand when you give it the video frames that, that's, that those video frames are at that time? Why do you have to like attach the metadata to the front of it and do all this work? So Faraz asked, well, if the browser tells you it needs video data for like 10 minutes in, why do you have to give it all this metadata to tell it exactly where you know, it's going? And there's, there's a few things to this. One is um, there's a lot more than just the time information. You have to say like this frame lasts, there's a lot of metadata involved here. I've been vastly oversimplifying. Um, I can actually show you what a little bit of it looks like in a somewhat intelligent, intelligible format. So this is an output file that is fragmented into these chunks. So there's groups of frames in here. And this is just some debug output that uh, another tool generates in XML just for me to look at as a human. Um, so this basically is, this is the metadata for a particular block. And it does in fact tell you, this number here actually is telling you where it is. And the reason this is kind of nice that you have to give it this data is you can give the data in kind of any order and the browser will nicely figure out how to stick it into the timeline. So that's part of the answer. The other part of the answer is, well, it, there's a lot more to the metadata. <laughs> So frames, for example, in popular formats like H.264 have, the frames aren't necessarily stored in the order that they're shown on the screen because they're stored, no, that would be too easy. Well, the real reason is that you, you, you have to, the way the format is designed, you have to, each frame in or the order it's in the file can only depend on frames earlier in the file. But that's not true of the dependencies when you're playing. So for example, there's in, in H.264, there's three kinds of frames. There's iframes where you, an iframe is basically just like an image. It just specifies the entire picture. Then there's P frames, which depend on previous frames. So a P frame basically would be like, you know, is like a diff, exactly. You move, you know, you take this iframe or another previous P frame and you modify it, like move things around a bit, replace certain parts of the frame, things like that. But then there's also B frames, which are bi-directional ones, which depend on both the past and the future. So a B frame can depend on, like, it can depend on, like you could have an iframe and then a B frame and then a P frame where, where the P frame depends on the I frame and then the B frame depends on the I frame before it and the P frame after and says it's somewhere in between. So, so you actually store it in the order of you do the I frame first, which is the first frame that you show. And then the second frame that you store would be the P frame, which is the third frame that you actually display. And then the last frame that you store is the one in the middle that you actually show in the middle. So this actually shows you. <laughs> no, it, it's very complicated. It's very complicated. And more or less, what you need to, like these numbers here are the off time offsets. So, so these say like, how much later do you show the frame than when you decode it? So, 
So like the these fact that these numbers are increasing and decreasing actually implies the order that the frames are displayed in. So you have to tell the browser all of this stuff explicitly. So uh, so this is why it's so complicated to do this video streaming stuff. And it's highly format dependent. So another thing I could do with this and might want to do eventually is make something that lets me um, play video formats that aren't natively supported by the browser. Like MKV, for example, isn't supported. So potentially, based on the same ideas, you could just remux something completely, where you take an MKV file in, and you can do HTTP requests, and then convert it into an MP4 file in JavaScript in the browser. And then you'd magically have support for new containers. Uh, you couldn't do that for new codecs, but at least for new container formats like MKV, theoretically that's possible. Um, I don't, that might be something I'll look into doing at some point. It's, it's been done before, but not for, not, not designed to just for general purpose use. It's been done for very specific kind of esoteric reasons. <laughs> Yeah, theoretically. Well, that's more complicated because then you need to actually decode everything. Then, you know, if you want to be able to decode formats, like, 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 um, I don't know, some weird codec that VLC supports that the browser doesn't support, that's a whole other can of worms. Because then you, then you go full VLC. yeah, full VLC. that's that's <laughs> going full VLC would be very painful. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, just to give you an idea of reprocessing the time data, essentially you you iterate through all of the frames in the video and you store all of these time off, you know, all these offsets and stuff, and then you re reformat it back into a new, um, completely new file, basically. So that's something I've been working on. It's almost working. Um, this will be the last thing I say. Let's see. Um, let's see. All of this code is very much a work in progress right now. But if I go here, there we go. I don't have the audio working, <laughs> but at least this video is playing where it's just over HTTP right now, but this is being remultiplexed in the browser. And it has proper back pressure for the stream. Yes, I know, I that's gonna take some work to fix. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm basically lying to the, to the browser and saying everything's a keyframe, an iframe. The reason I have to do that is because for right now, Chrome doesn't actually implement the spec correctly, so it'll just bail if you don't say ever that it's it's a bit complicated, but basically those fragments, those chunks, have to start with iframes to make Chrome happy. So you have to pretend they do until I go in and restructure things so that it actually builds the fragments around the iframes. So that's gonna be something I'm working on in the next few days, probably. Anyway, hopefully, Oh, this is like one of the classic test videos since it's, yeah. you know, it's, um, it's, uh, um, good question. Uh, it should be reasonable. I might not be, yeah, should just escape. I might not be, uh, yeah, there, there's another key for it. It's, um, no, there isn't. Uh, you can go to uh, Chrome slash memory, I think. Eh, well, I, I'm clearly not evicting everything I should be, but <laughs> once th this is very much a work in progress, once it's working, it should be pretty reasonable, like not more than a few hundred megabytes at most, even for arbitrarily long videos. This is really cool. It definitely qualifies as math science. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, does anybody else want to? Yeah.
One more. Uh, we have to be out of here soon, so we should probably hurry up. If you plug, plug that in the display port. And this in the USB port. I think it should work now. Okay, so I'm Francisco. Like, I don't have anything prepared, so I'm just like doing a demo of a project that I found out like a few months ago, and I think it was cool. Like, to do so. Like, I don't know how many of you know this, but there's a lib called Blast that lets you like do fancy user interfaces on the terminal. Uh, so you can do like these sorts of, of things. Like this exposes you like these different elements, like a box, an image, like uh, all those different things. Then there was a guy that like took this and created like a custom renderer for React that lets you like instead of using the HTML tags, like use those blessed elements. So, <laughs> like if you see code, like instead of using a div, for example, you would use a box. And like, so all these, like you could use a progress bar and all these different stuff. So like if you, if you see there, like there's a few demos on the project that like, so there's for example, demo. So if you go there, you do npm run demo. My internet connection has gotten really bad here. That's awesome. Anybody starting? Kind of. Okay, so. Yeah, like I, I also don't know like how familiar all of you are with React, but basically like you have a render function, and you return like usually you return HTML. In this case, you return like these blessed elements. And you can like specify your custom elements as well. So like this is a custom inner box that renders a box with like hey or no, like, depending on the on the step that you are. So this is cool. Like you, you can do like I can like demo the other ones. Animation. Oh, and me, right? Yeah, and I. can do like all these kind of different stuff. So then there's like another project that is blessed contrib that implements all these different graphics blessed contrib that like lets you do like graphics in the in the browser. Uh, yes. In the in the terminal, sorry. Um, That's sweet. That's sweet. Yeah. So like I this together, like I implemented these these tags into React Blast, like in a very like hacky way, so it's not published anywhere. It's just like it's on it's public on GitHub, like you can use my fork, but so this means you can use Blast Contrib. People turn off your Wi-Fi if you're not using it. Or even if you are using it. Yeah. This looks a bit So yeah, like you can use kind of crazy graphics like this because it's not very <laughs> responsive or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but yeah, so like taking this into account, like like so it's this is just like a country line and like that is a graphic, like you pass that data data into it. Wait, there's characters for like downward dots and upward dots? Uh those are each characters, right? Yeah, I think it's braille. Yeah, it's braille. Oh braille. That's yeah. hilarious. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So yeah. Those yeah. <laughs> Very nice. So like taking like using this like I wanted to like to apply it to, like a kind of real world project, and this friend of mine has a project called Minigun that is that that lets you like do load testing using Node. 
and like it renders nice graphics in the end. Like you can re generate a HTML report, but like I wanted to try to do that in real time. And so I implemented a plugin that does that. So it is like not really working right now because like I've done this like a very long time ago, <laughs> like two months ago. So, but I can show you the the demo with like mocked data. So if I go to here, like I can do npm run demo, and like so this is just mock data, but like it shows it shows you the progress. Like it shows like random status codes, like stats and like the medium what they see that you have on the on the responses. And like what's really cool is that like okay this is fine, but not everyone has the same window size on the on the terminal, so let's try to do a, a CLI responsive. So like if I resize this, like it just resizes and like shows stuff and like like the logo appears and disappears depending on, <laughs> on your screen size and Reactive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is basically it. Like, it's just something that I found that was really cool. Like, that's you like do fancy terminal interfaces that like people usually like to, to see, <laughs> and they can be like useful if you, if you have any uses for for that. So yeah, so this is basically it. Like, I. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs>